go back. Uh, I want to acknowledge um, that we are hosting this session on, on the unceded ancestral territory of the Coast Salish peoples. This includes the territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh nations, and the Métis Charter community of the Lower Mainland region. And all of you around this province and, or, and other places are also coming from your uh, ancestral and territorial uh, lands to which you acknowledge uh, and are, uh, think about this. This is the day after the first annual National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, and I hope you all had a, a reflective and thoughtful uh, beginning of a journey. And uh, just because we had one day um, to still remember and hold uh, true uh, your commitment to learning uh, more about uh, Indigenous peoples in this land. Next slide. So it's really a great privilege and pleasure for me to introduce uh, Dr. David Wheeler. David's a professor of kidney medicine at University College London, UK, and a consultant in the Royal Free Hospital uh, in the UK. He's a very well-spoken and uh, published clinician scientist interested in the complications of, of chronic kidney disease, especially cardiovascular disease, and those factors that accelerate um, progression of kidney failure. He's been uh, the head of or high, uh, very um, active participant in many of the recent several large clinical scale trials um, in all sorts of aspects of kidney disease, both dialysis and non-dialysis, most recently the DAPA CKD study. And he was the recent past co-chair of the clinical practice guideline uh, group KDGO, uh, Kidney Disease Improving Global Outcomes. Um, he's also um, the chair of the International Society of Nephrology Advancing Clinical Trials Committee and he is uh, the National Institute of Health Research Specialty Lead for Kidney Disorders. So David, it's really great for us to have you here to speak with us today um, on the recent advances in the management of chronic kidney disease. So I'll turn it over to you now. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Adira. Thank you for the invitation. It's my pleasure to be with you all. Um, towards the end of a busy day for me, but at the beginning, um, no doubt, of a busy day um, for, for all of you. Um, so I'm going to start uh, just by showing my disclosures, which are in the bottom left of the slide here, um, and the, my main university campus, which is actually right in the middle of central, right in the centre of London, which you wouldn't believe from the picture. So let's start with a case, and this is a patient we will all be familiar with as, as nephrologists, um, a 67-year-old Caucasian male. He's overweight, as you can see from the picture. He's had his diabetes for 10 years. He's had laser treatment for his diabetic retinopathy, so you know he's likely got diabetic nephropathy. Um, his blood pressure's too high. His HbA1c is too high. His EGFR is now 45 mils per minute, having been 52 mils per minute a year ago. So he's lost a fair amount of kidney function in a year and his urinary albumin to creatinine ratio um, is 655 milligram per gram. Now I learned yesterday um, that you, ac you actually use milligram per millimole um, in, in your country. And I thought you'd use milligram per gram like the US. So um, this is a, an A3 range uh, UACR. I've actually got our normal range in milligram per millimole on the right hand side here. So let's just say heavy albuminuria. He is on bisoprolol, amlodipine, he's on metformin, he's on glycoside, he's on citagliptin, and he's on atorvastatin. And what I want you to do just to start with is to reflect what other medications should this man be on? We're assuming he's got diabetic kidney disease, he's losing kidney function, his blood pressure is too high, and his HbA1c is too high. So I would argue that the obvious drug he's not on is an angiotensin receptor blocker. And I'm just showing here two trials published 20 years ago, the Renal study on the right, sorry, on the left, and the IDNT study on the right, two studies in patients with type 2 diabetes and chronic kidney disease, demonstrating the superiority of ARB over placebo in slowing the progression of kidney disease. We're looking at the proportion of, of uh, participants in these studies developing end-stage renal disease over time. 
And you'll see on the right hand side, there was an amlodipine arm in the IDNT study, similar blood pressure control to the herbisartan arm, but inferior outcomes in, in terms of uh, preventing um, kidney disease development with amlodipine. So there was some, there's something special about the angiotensin receptor blockers that slow progression of kidney disease in patients with type 2 diabetes. And of course, we all use these drugs or perhaps ACE inhibitors if they're cheaper uh, and we believe that they have the same benefits. And if we put together all the data now, and this is a recent meta-analysis that, that's come from the George in, in Sydney of, of all the ACE ARB trials in patients with chronic kidney disease. Um, and you'll see here, 119 trials, 64,000 participants, uh, mainly diabetic nephropathy trials, but some were non-diabetic nephropathy trials. Some were dialysis studies, and we're not obviously showing the data for those studies in this analysis, um, because we're actually looking here at uh, progression of kidney disease, um, so risk of renal failure. And you'll see here that for all these studies, whether, you, whether you're comparing ACE to placebo, ARB to placebo, ACE to other active controls, or ARB to other active controls, um, the, the totality of the data favor the ACE or ARB over the comparator. Uh, you've got the odds ratio at the, the bottom um, for the ACEs uh, and the ARBs. Um, and you'll see here uh, pretty robust data suggesting that these drugs are beneficial in preventing these uh, unfortunate kidney outcome events that, that we manage as, as nephrologists. Okay, so that was 20 years ago. And the, the sad thing is that over the last 20 years, up until perhaps a couple of years back, we really had no new therapies for chronic kidney disease. And I'm gonna focus on diabetic chronic kidney disease. So we had no new therapies for diabetic chronic kidney disease. And here are some of the failures along the way. Um, you may remember some of these drugs um, that really didn't make it um, to the marketplace, um, including things like aliscarin, which was a direct renin inhibitor, um, the use of we can all see, yeah, I'm gonna go back to where I was. Here we go, sorry about that. Anyway, it's a reality of life these days. So that, so nothing happened until, until about, around about 2019 when we got the results from this study, the Credence study. This was a study of canagliflozin in inpatients with a combination of chronic kidney disease and type two diabetes. You'll see the inclusion criteria top right. Uh, this was an international study um, with this new type of or newish type of, of drug for type 2 diabetes. The patients in this trial were already on maximum tolerated doses of ACE or ARBs. The randomization is shown there, regular follow-up, uh, and of course, a result that I think surprised many of us, um, that in this group of diabetic nephropathy patients, adding in the SGLT2 inhibitor, canagliflozin on top of the ACE or ARB led to a further 30% reduction in this composite primary of end-stage kidney disease, doubling of serum creatinine or death due to kidney or cardiovascular death. So uh, a fantastic outcome. And here are some of the secondary outcomes from the trial. There were reductions in cardiovascular endpoints as well, which of course are a big problem in this population, reductions in stroke, um, you go down the list, you, you, you lose significance at cardiovascular death. Um, and because you're meant to uh, analyze these data in, in hierarchical order, uh, you can't go further with your analysis. But some fairly impressive um, reductions in, in the common clinical outcomes that we see in this patient population. So that mean, brings me on to the DAPA-CKD study, which of course is the second study of a, an SGLT2 inhibitor in patients with chronic kidney disease, highlighting the differences between the trials in this slide. Lower EGFR range for the DAPA-CKD study, lower, lower limit of albuminuria. Sorry, I've got the milligram per gram there, um, but I'm sure you're used to converting. And most importantly, the DAPA-CKD study included patients with chronic kidney disease who did not have type 2 diabetes. Otherwise, the trials were similar. In DAPA-CKD, as in Credence, we tried to ensure that patients were on maximum tolerated doses of ACEs or ARBs. So here's the inclusion and exclusion criteria. It didn't matter what the cause of chronic kidney disease was, except 
We excluded patients with type 1 diabetes. We excluded polycystic kidney disease because we figured this drug wouldn't work on growing cysts. And we excluded patients who we felt um, were on um, immunosuppressive regimes um, that might impact on, on the clinical outcome. So we excluded those with, with lupus and glomerular disease who were on uh, immunosuppressive drugs. Randomization one-to-one to, -one to dapagliflozin, 10 milligrams versus placebo, endpoint driven trial, but we stopped early on the advice of the Data Safety Monitoring Committee. And, and Canada made a useful, a very useful contribution um, to recruitment into this study. So 4,304 participants of whom two thirds had type two diabetes as a comorbidity and one third did not have diabetes as a comorbidity and therefore did not have diabetic nephropathy. We'll come back to that in a minute. The primary outcome was very similar to Credence except instead of a doubling of serum creatinine, we used a greater than 50% uh, EGFR decline. We had three secondary outcomes, the primary without the cardiovascular death. So this is a pure renal uh, composite endpoint. Our second, uh, second secondary endpoint was the combination of cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization. And our third secondary was all cause mortality, which we did not expect to reach. So we put it third in our hierarchy so that it didn't um, mess up our analysis. Uh, and, and you may well be the, aware of the results of this trial, very similar to Credence, um, a 39% reduction in the risk of this composite endpoint uh, in those patients randomized to dapagliflozin compared to placebo. You need to treat 19 patients for 32 months um, to prevent one of these events. And we not only hit the primary outcome, but we hit the secondary, the, the three secondary outcomes in this study, including the all-cause mortality uh, outcome here at the bottom. Um, as you can see, these are all uh, statistically significant reductions um, in these endpoints, favoring dapagliflozin over the matched placebo. Now, the big question was, did it matter if the patients had diabetes or not? Um, and so we've got here our primary outcome at the top, and our three secondary outcomes, the overall results I've just shown you are in the blue bands and the subclassification sub by baseline diabetes status is shown below that for all of these outcomes. And you'll see here, there is no difference between the results for those who went into the trial with diabetes and those who went into the trial without diabetes. Remember, dapagliflozin is a drug developed for the treatment of diabetes. I can confidently say that there's no difference between the subgroups because if I look at the p-values on the right-hand side, these are testing for heterogeneity. They are testing for differences between the subgroups with and without type 2 diabetes. The p-values are not significant. There is no difference for any of these outcomes, including um, overall uh, mortality at the bottom. Okay, so just to make, just to stress the point about diabetes, let me talk you through this slide. This is the, um, this is the, uh, the hazard ratio for the primary outcome plotted against the baseline diabetes status of the patient. So you've got a range of baseline HbA1c's here. This is the hazard ratio in the blue line with the confidence intervals for the primary outcome. If the dr drug had no effect, this blue line would track along the dotted line, the line of null effect. It's below the dotted line, we know, because the, the treatment was beneficial. But you'll see here that this line is pretty flat. It doesn't really slope down towards the higher HbA1c levels. We are not really seeing a greater benefit of this drug in those participants who had the higher levels of HbA1c going into the trial. Now you could, um, you could argue there's a slight slope there, but if you look at the P for interaction value at the top, this is not a statistically significant difference. It didn't matter what the baseline HbA1c was, the benefits in terms of this primary outcome were similar in the trial. So there's been a lot of interest in subgroups in the trial. So you, you, you know, I'm telling you that this drug works in non-diabetic kidney disease. Does it work in glomerular nephritis? Yes, it does. Here's the primary composite and the kidney specific, the first secondary outcome um, for, for, for the overall population in the blue band. 
for those with glomerulonephritis in the white band, and for a subgroup of 270 patients with IgA nephropathy and a subgroup of 115 patients um, with focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. Now for IgA, we, we get a clear result. We're losing our significance for focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. Um, if you look at the numbers of events in, in the columns here, you'll see there's actually a halving of the numbers of, of, of primary um, composite events, um, but we lose significance um, with, with low numbers. But the, 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 the pattern here is similar. This therapy seems to work in IgA nephropathy patients on maximum ACE or ARBs and, in, 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 and a trend towards a benefit in FSGS patients. The other question we commonly get asked is how about those patients who went into the trial with the more severely impaired kidney function? So remember that our GFR criteria went down to 25 uh, mil per minute. So we recruited around about um, 624 patients who had stage four chronic kidney disease, a GFR below 30 going into this study. How did these patients do? So you've got here the primary and three secondary outcomes, the overall result the patients with stage four, smaller numbers, of course, um, compared to the patients with stage two, three, that's the rest of the participants in the trial. P for interactions on the right-hand side, none of these are significant. There is no difference in the benefit of these drug, this drug between patients who went in with stage four CKD compared to patients who went in with stages two, three CKD. We've asked, been asked about albuminuria. What happened to albuminuria in your trial? Um, and this is what happened to albuminuria, type two diabetes patients on the left, non-diabetes patients on the right. There's a surprising drop in albuminuria in the placebo group, which I suggest is because patients start taking their ACEs and ARBs more religiously when you tell them that they're randomized into a, an important clinical trial but a bigger reduction there, as you can see, in those randomized to dapagliflozin. Um, and we see that particularly in those with type two diabetes, less so um, in those without type two diabetes, but the effect is still there. And this is what we would expect from a drug that acutely reduces um, intraglomerular pressure. And these are data we just presented at the uh, European Association for the Study of Diabetes on Wednesday this week. We asked, did the baseline albuminuria predict the benefit of the drug? And, and you're looking here at a graph uh, or a plot similar to the one I showed you uh, for, for baseline HbA1c status. The difference here is that we're looking at baseline albuminuria status with diabetes on the left, no diabetes on the right. If the drug had no effect, the green line would track along the dotted line. The green line is below the dotted line because we know this drug was effective. And you'll see here that certainly for those with diabetes, we've got a flat line here for the hazard ratio across the range of baseline albuminuria. The message, the clinical message, it didn't matter what the baseline level of albuminuria was in the diabetic population, the benefits of the drug were the same right across this spectrum. Um, that goes right up to almost um, 5,000 milligram per gram. For those without type 2 diabetes, there is a slope on this line. There's a, a trend, if you like, towards a benefit at the higher levels of baseline albuminuria. The P for interaction value is not significant. So this is a trend. This is not a significant difference. Okay, this is, another, um, this is another piece of data we've just presented at the um, EASD meeting uh, two days ago. We took the combined uh, populations from the DAPA CKD study and the DAPA HF study, which you'll remember was the sister study of DAPA glyphosate in patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. Um, we had, a, um, we had a, a population of patients, if you combine those two studies, around about 4,000 patients who did not have type 2 diabetes at baseline. And we're asking here, did the allocation of drug during the study impact on the development of new onset diabetes during the follow-up period? And it did. There was a 33% reduction in the development of new onset diabetes in patients in these two studies randomized to dapagliflozin compared to placebo. 
So we're seeing, um, as we have seen in, with other drugs such as metformin, that we're protecting patients against the development of new onset diabetes. Most of these patients who we protected had prediabetes um, by WHO criteria. Now, the other concern with this drug is th this, these drugs lower glomerular filtration rate acutely. Um, and there's an acute drop in EGFR when we put patients on these drugs. Of course, we see this with ACEs and ARBs. We see this with SGLT2s. Now, just think about that. We're going to be prescribing or we are prescribing drugs that are meant to protect kidney function. But if we're asking our primary care, our family doctors to prescribe this drug, these drugs in these patients, and they do a blood test um, shortly after starting, they're going to see a reduction in EGFR and think they've, gone, they've done harm to the patient. I think we've got used to this now with ACEs and ARBs, and, and this to me is the most reassuring data around the safety of these drugs. This is acute kidney injury in the DAFA CKD study. Now, this is not a clinical outcome. This is a safety outcome that was reported by the investigators, um, and this is not adjudicated. But you'll see here um, a, a clear um, reduction in the likelihood of patients developing acute kidney injury if randomized to dapagliflozin. Uh, and this, it, this meets um, statistical significance. So, so I find this hugely reassuring when people start worrying about EGFR declines. And, and I would argue that we probably, in most patients, don't need to check an EGFR early after starting these drugs um, because we're not doing harm with AKI. So let me just conclude then from, from the DAPA CKD study. And, and this is um, a year on since our initial publication. Um, we, we see benefits of dapagliflozin across the range of baseline glycemic status. We see benefits across the range of kidney disease etiologies. We, we showed that at the ASN last year. Um, specifically, uh, we saw benefits in the IgA nephropathy um, subpopulation and a trend towards benefits that wasn't statistically significant in the FSGS population. Um, we see benefits in those participants who went into the study with stage four chronic kidney disease. We see benefits across the range of baseline levels of albuminuria. Um, I didn't show the data, but we've done some further analyses of all cause mortality, which was one of the more interesting um, aspects of this study. And, and in fact, the all cause mortality reduction is driven by reductions in, in non cardiovascular deaths, um, which I haven't shown today. Um, there, was, uh, there were reductions in albuminuria when we start this drug, particularly in those participants with type 2 diabetes. And the safety data around acute kidney injury, I hope you find reassuring. So that's the DAPA CKD study. So I would argue that the patient I presented at the beginning probably could be on, on DAPA glyphlosin 10 milligrams once a day. But hard on the heels of the SGLT2 inhibitor story, we've got the, the MRA studies that have just come out. Um, so this is the Fidelio DKD diabetic kidney disease study, which I wasn't involved in. Um, this was a study of phenerenone in patients with the combination of chronic kidney disease and type 2 diabetes uh, in a study that looked at kidney and cardiovascular endpoints. So you'll see the study design here. Um, patients needed to be on ACEs and ARBs, as in the DAPA CKD study. Uh, there were a few exclusions, including non-diabetic kidney disease uh, and high levels of HbA1c, a one-to-one -one randomization between phenerenone and placebo, um, 4,700 randomized follow-up for 2.6 years with the primary outcome being a composite kidney outcome similar to the NAPA CKD study, but the uh, EGFR cutoff was 40%. And then there's some secondary endpoints, including cardiovascular events in this study. And, and you'll be aware that this study was published towards the end of last year um, in the New England Journal of Medicine. This is the primary composite outcome um, the kidney outcome, um, which uh, was reduced by 18%. Um, you can see there the, uh, the confidence intervals, number needed to treat of 30 patients over 48 months, absolute risk reduction of 3.3%. So this is useful. So the obvious question here 
um, which I'll come to in a minute, is, is what would have happened if we'd added this into SGLT2 inhibitors. Here's the secondary outcome. This is a cardiovascular outcome. So as with the SGLT2s, um, I showed you the data from Credence on cardiovascular outcomes, and I showed you the data from DAPA CKD on cardiovascular, cardiovascular outcomes. We're seeing benefits on cardiovascular outcomes um, with the for, for, with finerenone um, in the diabetic, um, the, the Fidelio DKD study. Not a huge reduction, but this is statistically significant. So um, this is, I'm going to skip over this slide. Um, I'm going to go straight to the question about SGLT2 inhibitors. So if we look in the databases, of the, or the database of the Fidelio DKD study, there are some participants who were on SGLT2 inhibitors going into this study. And you'll see here in this table, um, the, the overall result at the top, this is actually the cardiovascular outcome, but we see very similar trends for the kidney outcome. Um, and you'll see here um, that the, the benefit, the, the, the benefit was still seen with the SGLT2 inhibitor at baseline. So in the small numbers of patients, you'll see here 124, 135 patients compared to 2,700. But in this small number of patients um, who were on SGLT2s at baseline going into the Fidelio DKD study, we still see a benefit. Now, how can I be so confident with that? Because the point estimates on the wrong side of the line of null effect, well, it's this p-value for heterogeneity or for interaction that, that provides that reassurance that, that this result for these, those on SGLT2s is not significantly different from the result in those who are not on SGLT2s at baseline. So what I'm saying in a rather convoluted way is that the, the, the benefits appeared to be statistically consistent in the Fidelio uh, DKD study uh, in those patients who went into the trial on SGLT2s. And we have similar data from the DAPA CKD study that I'm not going to show, suggesting that those patients who were on MRAs going into the DAPA CKD study gained the same benefits from study drug as those who were not on MRAs at baseline, which of course was a much bigger proportion um, of the population. Small numbers, but consistent benefits, at least from a statistical perspective. So I'm, I'm coming to a close now. Um, I would argue that we now have three therapies for the management of patients who have type 2 diabetes and chronic kidney disease. The first therapy, the RAS blockade, mainly the ARB studied 20 years ago. Two new therapies that have come along in quick succession, the SGLT2 inhibitor drugs, canagliflozin 100 milligrams, dapagliflozin 10 milligrams. And now the MRAs, and I should stress that the Fidelio trial um, was done with a new non-steroidal mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist. And I keep hearing George Bacris's voice in my head saying, remember, this is not your grandmother's spironolactone. Um, spironolactone has been around for 50 years. This is actually a new class of drug and has been recognized by the FDA as a new class of drug. So we probably should be cautious extrapolating um, data from, from spironolactone studies. Now, of course, the problem that you'll spot straight away is that two of these drugs um, cause hyperkalemia. And, and so if we're going to be using all three therapies in patients with declining kidney function, we're going to be running into problems with potassium. Um, but that's another story for another day. So let's round off by going back to our patient. Um, I would argue that this patient should be on uh, an, a, uh, an ACE inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blocker. My favorites are Ramipril 20 milligrams or Losartan, which um, actually that's, uh, that's, um, that's probably rather a high dose of Losartan. That's the right dose for Herbisartan, which I should have put there 300 milligrams once a day. This patient should be on dapagliflozin um, 10 milligrams once a day, and this patient should be on finerenone um, 10 milligrams once a day. Now, I wouldn't start all of those at once. I certainly wouldn't start Losartan 300. Apologize for that typo. That should be Herbisartan 300. I wouldn't start all these three drugs at once. I would start them sequentially, um, probably with a bit of a gap between them. But if we're going to maximize 
uh, the, 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 the benefit to this patient, um, we should certainly consider now um, this, this triple uh, type approach to therapy. I'm going to thank you for listening. Uh, I'm, I'm going to stop staring my, sharing my screen at that point. Thank you, David. Um, well, you have uh, over 75 people listening on a Friday morning at 7.30, so that's a, a great um, audience to have, uh, have reached. Um, your people are free to ask questions um, if, you, if they want. Um, I'll ask Brendan Sidon to help me watch the uh, hands going up. Um, but, um, you know, I think the points that you were making, there's, the question still comes up is, you know, when people have progressive decline and their GFR is 20, which is below what the DAP inclusion was, but you have nothing else to offer them. I mean, how comfortable are you give, um, starting SGLT2s at lower values? So I'm, I'm getting more and more comfortable. Let's remember that the patients who went into the Credence trial and the DAPA CKD trial stayed on study drug, um, even down to the point of starting dialysis. And we have anecdotal reports of investigators continuing study drug with the patient actually on uh, the, 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 the dialysis treatment. So, and, and we've looked carefully at that group and we can't see any unexpected safety concerns in that group. Now, of course, there's no reduction in HbA1c at those levels of EGFR because this drug works via the kidney. And when the kidneys don't work, the HbA1c lowering effect of these drugs doesn't work. Uh, and so clearly there are, there are other benefits of this drug. But I think certainly from the data in the trials that we've got, and I agree that it's limited, we're not seeing safety concerns um, and we're not seeing loss of efficacy in those lower EGFR groups. We don't see a massive reduction um, in, uh, in, in EGFR in that stage four subgroup that I showed you. I didn't show you the data, but we're not, you know, we're seeing the same reduction in EGFR as we're seeing uh, in those with, with higher, higher levels, starting levels of EGFR. And of course the labeling for you guys in Canada, because I had a, uh, I was at a meeting yesterday with, with Health Canada, that the labeling um, of dapagliflozin in, in, in Canada has not, um, has, has not given a lower EGFR restriction is my understanding. And it's the same as the label in the UK. We don't have a lower EGFR um, below which we, we shouldn't be prescribing, um, certainly um, in, in the, the new labels. And that's the same with the, the FDA approach to, the, to this as well, Adir. And in the chat is uh, Anushka from Perth. I thought that was you, Anushka. I, just, I didn't want to call you out. So uh, from Australia, and she was just saying that in Australia, they just got approval for DAPA um, for later or lower uh, kidney function. It's great. Yeah, do feel free that now I'm looking at a bunch of questions. Um, so interesting. Um, hold on. One of the usual questions is, do you think that there are differences between the different SGLT2 inhibitors? Well, that's, there, are drugs, there are drugs that cross over between SGLT2 and SGLT1 co-transporters and, and block both. Um, so urchigliflozin would be an example. I think for Canadapa and EMPA, which is certainly the drugs we use in the UK, I think we're seeing similar trends in, in the studies in both heart failure and chronic kidney disease. Um, somebody reminded me yesterday that in the EMPA preserve study, we didn't see kidney function benefits with EMPA glyphosin. Um, that trial is a little bit of an outlier in that respect. But I think the important thing is to get the patient onto one of these drugs, EMPA, DAPA, or, um, or, or CANA, um, in, and, uh, um, in, a, uh, in the doses that, that have been used in the trials. Um, and, and maximize the chances of protecting, protecting their kidneys. So I don't really mind which drug is used. I think it is generally a class effect. Yeah, and in this country, uh, our provinces have different accessibilities for all sorts of interesting reasons. A couple, there's a few more questions. Would you start an SGLT2 in a patient who did not tolerate an ACE or an ARB due yeah. to AKI? Um, yeah. And we could have a conversation about that, but. Uh, I, I would, because I don't think, I mean, I, you, want, you want to just ask why that patient got AKI on the ACE or ARB. 
and you want to be cautious in patients who are prone to dehydration. So, you know, my, my 86 year old lady who's on huge doses of loop diuretics for her heart failure is already on ACEs and ARBs. Um, I might just do a creatinine check at two weeks on, on her once I'd started the SGLT2. But generally, um, you know, I, I don't think, um, you know, we, we, we need to be too concerned about this. So um, I think that, you know, has, it, has your patient got renal artery stenosis? Did you unmask that with the ACE and ARBs? Are you going to unmask this with the SGLT2s? Possibly. Um, if you are worried, do, you know, do a blood check. But we're not, let me just stress, we are not seeing acute, AKA, acute kidney injury when we start these drugs in the context of a clinical trial. Yeah, and I guess just to reiterate um, for the question, if yes, your kidney function goes down, and yes, technically, if you look at the definition of AKI, that's an AKI, but we're not checking, and that's the whole point that David's making is like, so we've been not doing blood work sooner, just because we still, whereas with the ACEs, remember, you were doing them because it was also the problem with potassium. Right. Yeah, Whereas good point. So maybe you want to make a comment that like there's no potassium problems with SGLT2s. There were no potassium problems with SGLT2s. Okay. <laughs> I'll repeat what you said in here. But there yeah. aren't, you know, there aren't potassium. And, and when you're running into problems with, you know, ACEs, ARBs, and you're trying to add in MRAs, perhaps a heart failure, and they're not working, then the SGLT2s is probably a good option. Um, yeah. you know, and, and, unless you're going to start these potassium binders in your patients. There's a question um, and a comment uh, about the mechanism of the benefit besides hypoglycemia. And I, I think that's really worth, interesting and worthwhile answering. And, and perhaps the comment about polypharmacy, but we'll come back to that because one of the things we haven't done is started to deprescribe those drugs that are not working for our patients and just give them the drugs that are. And so that's yeah. a, a conversation. But what it just uh, the, the benefits of SGLT two besides lowering blood sugar? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that I, I hope I convince you that the benefits we're seeing in these trials are, are not due to reductions in blood sugar. We're we're, do, we're giving these drugs to patients who don't have type two diabetes. Baseline HbA one c status doesn't predict benefits. So so these drugs are doing something else. Um, the best story, and and I call it a story because I don't think there's any good proof for it is, is that we're actually constricting the afferent arteriole um, in patients already on ACEs and ARBs who have the efferent arteriole already dilated. So by constricting the afferent arteriole um, through switching on tubular glomerular feedback, um, we're actually reducing the inflow of blood into the glomerulus and further reducing the intraglomerular pressure. And that fits with the physiological changes in EGFR uh, or at least the, the drop in EGFR fits with that physiologically and the drop in albuminuria fits with that physiologically. But I don't think that can be the whole story. And I think there's probably something we're missing in, in terms of how these drugs are working that we need to better understand. Yeah, I, mean, I think those studies are ongoing. So switching gears now in terms of venerinone and uh, as George says, the, your grandma's spironolactone. Um, for the audience, the major class difference in terms of the side effect profile, I, I think it's interesting. Yeah. Didn't go into that, but I think it's a good chance to do that. I, I didn't. And there was an excess of hyperkalemia in the, the Fidelio DKD study and in the Figaro study, which was the sister study to the Fidelio DKD study. So we had, there is, le there is thought to be less hyperkalemia on phenerenone compared to with eplerenone, which you may have had, and for both drugs when compared with spironolactone. So the, the hyperkalemia is less of a problem, it is still a problem, and there were still patients coming out of this study, because the, the Fidelio study, because of hyperkalemia. So that problem has not completely gone away. I think, but for context, um, it's a very short acting, right? I think that's the other thing yep. that I did not appreciate is that phenerenone is, has a very short half-life relative to spironolactone. Yeah. And the changes in potassium are like 0 0.43 or something. Like it's quite, it's like, it's, it's a problem, but, you know, it's, is it? <laughs> I think it's, that's... It's less of a problem. It's less of a problem than we saw with spironolactone. Um, right. I think it'll still be a problem in clinical practice, to be honest with you. Yeah. Yeah. And that was one of the questions um, from one of our transplant um, fellows. 
is, do you think fentanyl is ready for prime time with the hyperkalemia? And is there going, because the studies are all very vigilant um, and the run through weeded out all the hyperkalemic patients. So to whom does Fidelio and Figaro apply? So there's, there's all this worry, isn't there, that if you go back to the RAL study of spironolactone, you know, in heart failure, um, and, and there's a plot of the incidence of hyperkalemia and hyperkalemia admissions and so on after that, I think people are worried about a repeat of that sort of problem. I think we need to be cautious and, and let's, you know, I, I presented, um, you know, a little bit tongue in cheek, you know, a patient who I thought would benefit from three agents, but let's just, let's just do this slowly. Let's make sure our patients with type 2 diabetes are on ACEs and ARBs, first of all, because many of ours aren't when they get referred to us. Let's then maximize the dose of ACE or ARB. Let's then cautiously add in the SGLT2 inhibitor, which shouldn't affect the potassium. And then if, we're, if we can achieve all of that, then let's add in um, the, the MRA as our third option. We don't have the MRA available yet in our part of the world, so it's not an option. And I don't think we're going to be going back to starting spironolactone in patients with GFRs that are less than you know, 30, 25, unless they've got profound heart failure. So I think, I think we should just take this slowly and cautiously and learn along the way. But, but I think what I wanted to try and point out is there are now options for this man um, that we didn't have you know, five years ago. Right. And um, another question, and maybe again, worth clarifying, um, if TG feedback is operating in chronic kidney disease, um, can we start SGLT2 in patients with hypertensive nephrosclerosis and other causes um, other than diabetes? And I think you were making that point uh, with the DAPA. Study. Yeah, I mean, I think in DAPA CKD, um, you know, after after um, diabetes and glomerular disease, the next big group was a group of patients labeled as having ischemic stroke hypertensive nephropathy, which I think means hypertension, small kidneys, and we haven't done a biopsy. Um, and, and, you know, many of those patients, of course, are going to have just scarring if you, if you do biopsy. So I, I think they're, they're a good group to offer this therapy to. Um, and, and certainly that subgroup in the trial showed benefits um, to the same degree as the diabetic subgroup and, and the glomerulonephritis subgroup. Great. Thank you. Other questions? Um, uh, so in the transplant population, what do you think about failing graft? Well, it's tempting, isn't it? You know, here's a, a population of patients, you know, with, with declining kidney function for whom immunosuppression is probably not going to fix anything now, um, who are at high risk of developing type 2 diabetes if they haven't got it already, um, and, and have problems, you know, with, with fluid overload and, and, and heart failure. So it's very tempting. Um, What's the possible downside? Might there be more urosepsis? I didn't talk about side effects and probably should have stressed that in the trials, um, there was no excess risk of urinary urosepsis in, in, in either the DAPA or the Credence, the DAPA or the Credence studies. Um, you know, so, so that, that, that may or may not be a problem. I think we still, well, we, I know we still see genital fungal infections in these patients when we treat with these drugs, um, and that will be a problem in the transplant population. Um, I would like to do a study rather than just um, suggesting that we should treat all our transplant with these drugs, and I think there are efforts to get studies up and, and running. But there have been published case series and small studies now of up to sort of 40, 50 patients suggesting there could be benefits and there aren't any um there aren't any really bad side effects that, that are obvious from from small case series and, and small studies so it's yeah. it's it's appealing yeah it is and i know in canada they're talking a little bit about um about um starting a study or, or working with others um in patients that are on diuretics and ACEs and ARBs, do you routinely stop the diuretic with the intro of the SGLT2? So I, I would, I would, I would be cautious with a loop. I think you're, um, Ambi, you're <laughs> suggesting hydrochlorothiazide, which I taught teach my students is a fairly weak diuretic. Um, but you're worried probably because it acts in the distal tubule. Um, 
I think, I think we need to be careful. Um, I think, as I said, in a patient prone to dehydration, um, who, in whom you would be cautious increasing uh, the dose of a loop diuretic, I would also be cautious adding in this drug, which will have a diuretic effect. And I think it may be reasonable to suspend the diuretic for a couple of days or a week or so, um, or to make sure you know that this is a patient who gets a blood test done fairly soon after starting or gets reviewed fairly soon after starting. So I think we do need to be cautious um, you know, with, with loop and distal tubular diuretics. Yeah, I mean, I was out of uh, some other, I think that the heart, the cardiologists are, are now saying that unless they get hypotensive and dizzy, they don't reduce the diuretics. Yeah, uh, yeah they, they are slightly more cavalier than the nephrologists. They may be yeah. right, um, but we will pick up the pieces for them. So, um, <laughs> you know, let, let's see where that goes. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm taking a more cautious approach and reminding them that, you know, dehydrating patients is, is not good for, for kidneys. Right. Um, even though we haven't seen an excess of acute kidney injury, you know, in a trial setting. Yeah, no, I've been, um, I think we've just been watching and, and checking blood pressures and things like that yeah. and making people drink water. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think I see any additional questions. Um, so, um, I want to thank you for making the time. Um, as always, it would have been lovely to have you here. Um, however, perhaps Zoom has allowed us to be um, have access to people uh, without inconveniencing them, uh, albeit nice to come to, for international travel. Um, I just want to remind this audience um, that there are evaluations that you fill in after this and, and thank David. And next week, same time, same place, uh, we're going to have a a stimulating talk by a colleague of David's, uh, or a, a, yes, a, a colleague, um, Peter Steinwinkel, on a very interesting topic of evolution and adaptation and what we learn from nature about kidney diseases. So I hope you'll all come back next week. But David, thank you very much for this week and enjoy your weekend. You're a lot closer to the beginning of it than me. <laughs> Delighted. I'm looking forward to it, Adira. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining and thank you for inviting me to speak. Um, it's okay. an honor and a pleasure. Thank you. Bye, everybody. You. Bye for now. Bye-bye.